Hi everybody, what we're going to cover in this video is how to do t-tests. So we're going to do independent and dependent t, along with data screening for t-tests, um, effect size and power using g-power. Uh, so this, uh, our code will be on our website when we're done. You can also download Moat from that website. g-power is freely available from the creator's website, just google g-power. Uh, so first thing I did here was just make up some data. So I have two measurements, time one and time two of understanding R and statistics in R. I'm going to bind all that together with a group label. Um, and so I have two groups, one who's been watching my YouTube videos and the other ones who are taking this with me in class. Um, and so I'm going to factor that variable using the factor command, which I have in a different video, just so that I have some labels. You can run t-tests without the labels using um, that are integer variables, but I promise you it'll be a lot better if you have those labels, plus then it's easier to make the pictures. Okay. So this data is in wide format, which means each participant has their own row. And so I have time one for participant one and time two for participant two. If you're doing this as independent t and for data screening, I tell you to leave it in wide format. Um, we'll do something here in a minute where we switch it to long format. Um, so first thing we've really got to do in any analysis is really actually calculate power. But I'm going to show you power at the end as an example of like if I were to do this again, how many participants would have I needed given this exact effect size? But generally you'd want to estimate power before you start with, a, with the idea of what, what are the effect sizes that have existed in the past. But what we're going to do is actually start with data screening. So we're going to pretend like the study is already done. We calculated power the first time, needed 100 people, and so here we go. Um, in the theory, this is uh, this data set is a mixed design. I have one independent variable and one repeated metrics variable, and you'd really want to do a mixed ANOVA on that, but I'm trying to show you how t-tests work, so we're going to pretend like that wasn't the plan. So for data screening, I tell you to leave it in wide format, and um, we'll really get to why here in a second. Leave it in wide. So when you start with data screening, the first thing is always to check for accuracy. So I'm going to take a summary of my data set and look at what uh, happened. So my group labels look fine. They are, um, there aren't any extra weird ones. And my measure, um, I just made it up on the fly. So let's say it runs from 0 to 25. So I don't have any problems within that measure. And so this video isn't really to show you missing data or accuracy issues. I would watch one of my other videos for that. Um, so we don't have any accuracy problems and we don't really have any missing data. So I would say accuracy uh, looks okay. And then usually the next thing you do is check for missing data. It's the same summary from before. So what you would do is just check for NAs. And if you have missing data, it'll say NA down here. Now I'm just going to show you real quick um, what, what can happen with missing data. So this is totally an example that I'm about to walk through of dealing with missing data on, um, on simple analyses. Okay. Um, so I have to first create some missing data. So I'm just going to create some missing data by Let's say, let's delete anything below 10. So we're going to exclude people whose ratings don't uh, add up to 10. <clears throat> okay. So what we would do is, uh, let's do this. So example data, and let's do measure one. Um, and so we want to look for example data, measure one, right? is less than 10, right? I'm going to set that to an A. So now let's take a summary, and you'll see what I did wrong here in a second. Um, oh, it, were, it worked fine. JK. So it created 27 NAs in, within that one column only. So um, I thought it was going to set the whole line to NA, but apparently I did it right the first time. So I struggle to remember these rules still myself, and um, I've been doing this for a while. So um, Okay, so we got less than 10, and so that created all these NAs. And if you aren't sure, you can always click on it and look and see what happened. Um, so 
anybody who scored a bad score here got excluded. Um, so what we're going to do now is now that I have this missing data, what I have to do is calculate the percent missing. Okay. So I'm going to make myself a little function called percent miss. And this is explained better in one of my other videos. So I got a function here to calculate how much missing, how much data is missing. So we're going to add up the NA values for whatever column we're looking at or row. We're going to divide by the length of that row. So this just totals up the number of missing values here. Uh, make sure I have it close, right? And then it's dividing by the length times 100 to give us a percentage. And then what I would do is calculate by column. And so I'm going to use the apply function for that. So let's go apply. I'm going to data set name. One for rows, two for columns. And we're going to fill in our new fancy function. Okay. Um, since I have 100 people, this becomes 27%. So I shouldn't fill in that column because it's more than 5%. So 5% is the general rule. Um, so this is, this is bad, 27%. So we wouldn't want to fill that in. We would want to exclude that column completely. Um, now let's calculate by row. Okay. So by sample data. One for rows. But whoa, look at all this craziness. So that's no good. Let's save it. So I can look at this a little better. So I'm going to take a summary of my missing data. So I save this as missing. And now I'm taking a summary of it. And maybe I didn't want summary. Let's try a table instead. There we go. So 73 people are missing no data. So here's 73, no missing data. And 27 people are missing 33%. Well, 33% is way too much of their data because they're missing one of the three rows we have. So really, we can't fill in any of this fake missing data um, because it's missing too much by row and by column. But And so at this point, I would just go Meh, and move on with the example data set. So I wouldn't really do anything um, missing data-wise because it's clear that I have data that I can't fill in because they're all over 5%. But if you're not so good at this and you're trying to like say, okay, now I'm gonna exclude too much missing. Okay. And I really cover how to break this down in my um, data screening video a little better, but usually the kind of the way I figured out is people I wanna replace, or here, let's call it replace rows. So these are the rows that I can replace. Okay. So what we're gonna do is exclude people so I got my example data, who's missing is less than 5%. Okay, so that is gonna cut out everybody who has more than 5% missing. Okay, and I wanna get, uh, so that's by row, give me all columns back. Okay, so this excludes uh, too much missing. Okay, you can also do this with the subset function. So my replace row data set has 73 observations because those are the people who are this column. And my don't row is just the opposite. Those are the other people, in case I need them back for some reason. <clears throat> so what happens is I haven't lost the people who have more than 5% missing. I have them held on somewhere. Okay, and if you don't want to use them at all, um, that would be excluding them list-wise. But if you are analyzing, let's say, three or four different, um, three or four different um, scales, and you want to exclude them one scale at a time, and so you're doing data screening one scale at a time, um, this would be allow you to stick them back into the data set so you don't lose them. Um, and so that code just really is so that I can put people back for pairwise elimination. Um, if you want to do list-wise, this is where you'd stop. You have the, the number of rows you want to replace. Um, at this point, here's what I'm going to suggest. And I didn't do this the first time, and I think it really led to some problems in one of my classes. So I tell you right now, if you haven't been paying attention, 
It's like, I know just because of this that I, I don't have any missing data at this point because I've cut all these people out. But you know, if you're just kind of plugging and chugging code that you're still trying to figure out, stop and take a summary here. And so I can look at this summary and there's no missing data. So if I try to use a missing data piece here, it would just be like, what the hell, what do you want? And so there's no missing data, you just stop. And you would keep using this data set if you wanted to do list-wise elimination of more than 5%. If you want to do pairwise elimination, just go back to the data set you had here under example data. Okay. Um, and so, like I said, if you're trying to run um, mice is the popular package, at this point it's going gonna, it's gonna to not be happy with you. But just to prove that, let me show you. So this is the mice library. And so I'm going to say temporary, no missing data set. I'm going to mice it. Um, and let's try micing my replace row. Okay. And so it tells me no missing data, no missing values found. Well, that's because by excluding them at 5%, um, there I've excluded everyone. And that'll happen when you have very small data sets where there's just like, they have way too much, you know, at this point they have too much missing data because if you're missing one piece, you're automatically missing a third of your data. And so if you get here and it has no missing data found, just go with the replacement of the rows. Okay. Um, if you had had missing data at this point, you would also break it down by column. Uh, and so we didn't want to replace columns that have too much missing data or are categorical. Uh, and so you can watch that in my data screening only video, and I'm sure it'll happen again in some of these other ones. But this is really just to make sure that you understand in very small data sets, when people are missing even one data point, that puts them over the limit. And this is very, a uh, very conservative missing data approach. Um, and then at that point, you know, if you hit, if you aren't, if you haven't noticed, and you hit mice, it says no missing values. Just go back to the rows that you can use. Okay? And even if you decide to go back to the entire example data set with people with missing data, it will exclude them pairwise because they'll get excluded when uh, they need to be excluded. If you're wanting to do list wise, which on a simple t-test, they're the same thing, um, then just exclude them all. So go with the replace row data. And so that whole thing is just an example. I don't actually have any problems with this data set, so I'm gonna recreate it from the beginning. Um, now, do know this is a random uh, creation, so you and I will get different numbers if you're running this at the same time as me, because it will create us different random data sets every single time, but that's okay. It should give you approximately the same, close to the same numbers as me. But it won't be perfect. <clears throat> Alright, so the whole thing was an example. Because we didn't actually have any missing data. Okay. So I'm going to run a summary again. Ooh. It didn't, whatever that was, didn't like it. There we go. Okay. Um, and so I don't have any missing data, so I'm going to move on. So I did accuracy, I did missing data. Now let's talk about outliers. So outliers are a tricky issue. Um, when you're working with, let's say, just an independent T, you're only going to have one column of data. So if you only have one column of continuous data that you want to screen, you have to do univariate z-scores. So if you only have one column. So this is between subjects with one variable. Okay. Um, and so, like a between subjects, so ANOVA is only going to have one DV column, and an independent t-test is only going to have one DV column. You're going to have to use z-scores. Um, Mahalanobis will not calculate with only one column because there's no way to calculate covariance. Okay, because covariance requires two columns. Okay. And so what you would do is z-score that column. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to pretend like I only have measure one. Let's say I didn't take measure two, I just took measure one. What I would do is um, create myself a z-score column. So it's the scale function and then I would put in example data measure one. Okay. And now I have my z-score saved. So it's clickable, could look and see if I have any outliers. 
So remember, we're going to use the rule as three. So three standard deviations away because we want things to be really crazy before we eliminate them. So I don't have any on the top or the bottom. So I don't have any outliers. Um, and that's just me looking at it. So what you could do is exclude people who have too many outliers in the exact same way that you exclude people for missing data. So what I can do here, let's do example data. And this won't screw up my data because I don't have any missing. For measure one, let us, um, actually no, sorry. Let's just do example data and let's exclude people. So example data where uh, measure one is greater than, nope, 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 sorry, it's okay. I've lost all my brain cells today. We're gonna do the absolute value of the z-score this time. So ABS is for absolute value is greater than or equal to three. Okay, and that will eliminate people who have um, a z-score greater than three. So this shouldn't change anything. Okay. Uh, and it, it's kind of grumpy with me because it says zero rows. So there are no people whose scores are greater than three. So just to kind of show you how this would work, let's say you wanted to use a different cutoff score, so this should eliminate people. Okay. Um, oh, I want to eliminate people. So I want people whose scores are um, less than three. Sorry. We want to keep people whose scores are less than three. There we go. I did that backwards. So we want them to be less than or equal to three. Otherwise, they're going to get dropped. So it was really unhappy with me because I dropped everyone. Um, if I wanted to change that, so let's keep people whose scores are less than 1.96. That should change our data set. Right? <clears throat> equal to unexpected equals. Okay, put the equals there. There we go. Had in the wrong order. Um, and so now it would have dropped people. And so you'd want to save that. So I have one, see I'm missing person number seven here. So let's go 3.0 is the rule. And I'm just going to save it as the uh, no out data set. Okay. So no outlier still has 100 people because that didn't eliminate anybody. But this is how you would exclude people based on one column of data, which is important if you have t-tests, uh, independent t, or um, between subjects ANOVA, and you don't have anything else in the data set. However, um, if you have repeated measures or multiple hypotheses, so I have lots of data in this data set, I'm gonna tell you to screen the entire row. So um, we're gonna screen this by person. So this is why it needs to be in wide format. And remember that wide format um, is where all the repeated measures are columns. And so each person is their own unique flower, so they get their own row. I do like long format a little better, but data screening wise, wide format makes more sense. Why? Because you're allowed to see the covariance between measures, um, which is important for some of the assumptions. Uh, and it allows you to calculate outlier scores based on the fact that this is person one the entire time. So we'll be able to use the column means and the covariances between columns, which really means like how much people um, are changing at the same rate, um, to calculate Mahalanobis distance. All right, so if you have more than one column that you want to screen, go multivariate. If you only have one column to screen, you have to go with z-scores um, because otherwise you can't make the analysis work essentially. And so we have our example data set that actually has two columns we want to screen, time one and time two, basically. Uh, so I'm going to use Mahalanobis for that. So I'm going to call it Mahal. It is the Mahalanobis function. Okay. And the way that works is you're going to do the data set, but you need to drop any columns that are categorical. So I'm going to drop column one because it is our group variable, so we don't want to include that. And then you need to do call means. So what function do you want to use to center it? So I'm going to go example data. Okay. Negative one. If your data set has missing values, here you would do na.rm equals true. Okay. 
Um, and then we want to do cov for covariance table. So um, same thing, example data, drop column one. Okay, so this piece here needs to be the same all three times. And then I want to do use pairwise complete obs for dropping any missing data. I don't have any missing data, so this is just extra, but this code will work if you do. So that calculated some Mahalanobis distance scores for me, which is great. But now I need a way to figure out how to um, tell if those scores are unusual. So let's create a cutoff score. We're going to use the chi-square distribution, so q chi-square. So Q-chi-squared, we're going to do, uh, since a cumulative distribution, we want only people who are on the top end. Mahalanobis is always positive. So I only want people who are in that right tail, whose scores are really crazy. So we're going to use 001 as our cutoff rule, which means this has to be 999. Because we it does, um, it does the lower tail as true automatically. You could do 001 and do lower tail false, but I just find it easier to remember that I want people who are 99.9% .9 crazy. So their scores are, the likelihood of their scores is 0.1%. Um, okay. uh, and then degrees of freedom is going to be um, the number of columns in my example data that I used a minute ago. So it's the number of columns from this. So whatever you have here, just cut and paste it down here. So that gives me a cutoff of 13.82. So I'm looking at it right here. If you aren't sure, you can just type cutoff down here and it'll give you the score. Uh, and that's because I have two columns. Okay, so I'm screening measure one and measure two right now. Two for P less than 0 0.001 on a chi-square table is 13.82. So now let's take a summary of how many people's scores are less than the cutoff. Okay. And it doesn't look like anybody. So I don't have any scores that are um, across both variables significantly weird. And so people's patterns of scores are within the normal range. Okay. So I don't have any missing data, but in, if you did, I'm sorry, I don't have any outliers, but if you did, you could exclude them in the same way. So no out equals example data, okay. where well, we want only people whose Mahalanobis distance scores are less than the cutoff, okay. and all columns back. And so that's actually what I messed up up here. I want people whose scores are less than the cutoff. The cutoff is the range that it's too high. So anybody above that score is bad, and anybody below that score is fine. And that's what I screwed up up here. <laughs> Alright, so now I have a no out data set, but really... There's no outliers with this data set. I'm just showing you how you do it in case you did. So I've checked accuracy, missing data, and outliers. Now we're going to move into assumptions. <laughs> and so normally the first assumption to check is additivity. Um, now I can check the correlations um, here if I wanted to. So I could look at the correlations between measure one and measure two. But the thing about that is, um, since this is dependent t, there is no sphericity assumption because there's only two measures, two time points, and so that assumption will not apply. And the whole point of repeated measures is that you expect their measurements to be correlated, um, unless you have two very different things. And if you have two very different measure, different pieces, um, you're going to have trouble with power. And so you expect things to be correlated. So the additivity assumption actually does not apply to repeat, repeated measures. Because in reality, what you have is one dependent variable measured, um, measured twice. And so that one dependent variable measured twice, with only one variable, there's no correlation additivity problem. Because remember, additivity is when I want my each variable to add something to the equation. Um, and so repeated measures, you actually, the, the, the correlations being very high is actually very good for you. It's a, it's a power thing. So it doesn't really apply. Um, you can check it if you want, but it will still run um, 
as long as they aren't perfectly correlated. If they're perfectly correlated, um, it gets to be a bit of a math problem. So instead, let's check for the rest of the assumptions. Okay. So I'm going to start by setting everything up for the assumptions. So we're going to run a fake regression. So I need some random data. So I'm going to create a random, uh, a random number to start. So I'm going to use our chi-square this time. Okay. First one is n, so I'm going to do n row of my data set. Uh, we're using no out now. Um, so as I created this no outliers data set here, I want to use it here. So one big thing is if you are changing your data sets as you go, be sure you're using the right one. Um, I really only have two at the moment because I haven't had to do a whole lot, but if you've excluded missing and excluded outliers, make sure you're using the one, the last one you've been using. Don't go back to the original one because then you've wasted your time in the, in the steps where you fixed it. Uh, okay, so I'm going to do the number of rows because that's how many random numbers I need. And then my magic DF is 7. Okay, and that's just because the, the using a 7 has worked for me a lot. Okay, and that's explained more in the data screening video. Okay. So I've got my random number. Now I'm going to set up my fake regression just so I can get some numbers here. So LM function. We're going to use that random variable we just created as Y. Is approximately dot for the entire data set, comma, data equals no out. Okay. Um, and creating different data sets will allow you to change this here if you're wanting to screen uh, the data sets in different ways. So we're going to create our fake regression. And that is saved so that we can do this. I'm going to create my standardized residuals and that function is our student of that fake regression I just ran. I'm also going to create myself some fitted values for my homoscedasticity and homogeneity plots. So fitted values are in my, we're going to, um, sorry, let's scale those, let's z-score them to make it easy to interpret. And we're going to do fake dollar sign fitted values. And so now I have everything I need to make these next charts. So starting with normality, <coughs> let's take a histogram of our standardized residuals. So what you want to look for is most of the data needs to be centered over zero between two and two. And so that's pretty normal. It's like one of the most perfect normal ones I've seen in a long time because I made this up with a normal distribution, so fake data. Maybe, maybe just a very, very slight positive skew. So there are slightly more numbers down here, but otherwise it looks fine. You could also, if you so desired, take histograms of the individual measures. But I like the multivariate path because then I only have to check one thing at a time. So if I had 300 columns, this would not be a useful thing. And so here's something kind of fun. This is made up with a normal distribution. Um, and so you see we have two little humps here. And that is going to happen because our groups, our grouping variable, have two different, um, they're, they're, I set them up to have very different means. And so this bimodal distribution is because of the grouping variable. Um, and so I like the multivariate normality one better because it shows me that um, um, across both variables, it's pretty normal. Okay, so this is not normal. <laughs> All right. And um, it's almost a little misleading because it is there, there are two normal distributions by group. And so if you get this kind of distribution and you have a grouping variable, it might help to subset and split it by group and see what happens when you have just group one and group two. Mm -hmm. uh, you can also calculate skew and kurtosis values with the moments library. Um, and so what I'm going to do is calculate uh, skew and kurtosis for the entire variable first. So let's use the apply function. So I'm going to calculate this on my example data set, calculate by column, um, but I need to exclude that gender column, I'm not gender, sorry, group column, ACK, sorry, no out. I just said, be sure you use the right data set, and then look what I did, I used the wrong one. Okay. And they won't change, because uh, it is the exact same data. But 
I'm going to keep using my no outliers data set. Okay. So I dropped the first column because it is categorical and it won't want to do this. So skewness is how you calculate skew. So that gave me the skew for each individual measure. And then I want to do the exact same thing, but this time kurtosis. Oops, sorry, kurtosis. Um, oops, sorry, by column. There we go. So measure one is kind of kurtotic, uh, but three is the rule. Now let's say I wanted to look at this by group. So let's separate by group. That's T apply. Okay. So the way T apply works is you pick the column first. And then you pick the group, grouping variable. There we go. Group. And then you tell it what to do. Okay. So T apply works very differently. Um, apply is data set, rows or columns, function. T apply is column, group column, and function. So now if I look at the skewness by group, they're okay. If I couldn't type them, I'd cut and paste this. Let's do kurtosis by group, and they're about the same. Okay. So if I wanted this now, if I wanted to do measure two, I'd have to do this whole thing again and do measure two. Um, but I could calculate by group as well, and everything seems to be okay. <clears throat> okay this group is starting to be a kurtosis problem, but transforms don't work very well. So I'd say eh, just get with it. Let's do now linearity. Okay. Linearity is the QQ norm function on the standardized residuals. Okay. Now to be able to read this chart better, I'm gonna do AB line zero comma one, and then I'll add the line for us. Now let me blow this up, and I'd say it's pretty good. So you want most of the data to be close to the line, and so this is a very linear plot because I made it that way, and you'll always have these couple little people that are down here and not very good. But the majority of the data is close to the line, so it's okay. And then let's get into homogeneity and homoscedasticity. Okay. Homoscedasticity actually doesn't really apply in um, these sort of instances because we're dealing with groups um, instead of continuous variables, but it doesn't hurt to sort of check for both uh, because it's the same picture. So, you know, uh, but really this one's all about homogeneity. Okay. And we will see how you can try um, fixing homogeneity problems in um, uh, independent T. So we're going to make a plot of our fitted values on X. So that's where the fitted part comes in. So all the X variables together, which is all our continuous measures, uh, compared to the standardized values the standardized residuals on y. So there's our pretty plot. I'm going to add a line at 0, 0 to cross the 0 line to help it make me judge it better. And then a vertical 0 line to make it even easier. So this is a residual scatter plot of the standardized residuals compared to our fitted values. And so what you want is roughly the same number of dots in each quadrant. So we're starting to have problems homogeneity wise because it does not, it ranges from negative one to zero to three. Okay, you want this to be an even spread. I would argue it's, it's kind of okay because most of the data is between two and two, where two would be down here. So I'd say it's per likely all right. And then this way as well, you want the data to be between centered around zero. The down part is much better. Uh, you get these two sort of clumps of data because of your group variable. Um, for homoscedasticity, I just want to make sure the spread is equal all the way across, and it actually is very pretty. So you could draw like a circle around it, and if it makes a blob, it looks fine. And so this is a very blobby, is a very good data set. <clears throat> and so that is how do I do data screening? So I haven't really changed anything, but I have shown you working through the entire um, data set. Let's really now get into how do I run a c-test. So let's do independent t. Okay. So with independent t, remember you need um, 
one group column and one dependent variable column. So we're going to start by looking at our group variable to see if they are different at time one. So the first time we measure them, are they different? Okay, we'll do this twice. We'll do time one and time two. So the function is t.test. And so uh, what you're going to do is type it in the same way that you type an lm function. So we're going to do y. So y is our no, uh, sorry, we don't need that. Um, y is our measure one approximated by group variable. Okay. There are other ways to do this, but I would suggest getting used to this way of writing it because that is the way many, many, many functions work in R. And so y is approximately equal to x plus x plus x. Um, and that will help you when you get into running some other functions. So ignore the other ways to do it. Uh, then we're going to say what the data is. So we're going to use the no out data set. If I can spell it, good gracious. There we go. We're going to do var dot equal, and let's start with true. Okay. So let's say we assumed equal variances because the homogeneity thing looked okay. And then the last one is paired equals false, okay. and that's actually the default. But if you if you remember to include this, you'll know which one you're running. So let me run that. Ooh, 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 ooh. So you can tell that it ran a normal t-test because the degrees of freedom for t-test is n minus 2. So uh, in like group 1 minus 1 plus group 2 minus 1 or the entire data set minus 2. Um, if you don't like scientific notation for your p-values, what you should do is use the options function. Psi-pin equals 999. I don't really know, but that turns off scientific notation. And now we have our values, so 0, 0, 0, 0 2. Okay. Um, and it's saying that the means are significantly different because it's less than 0.05, got 80, 98 degrees of freedom, and then here's t. Okay. You get the confidence interval for the mean difference score, and then I get my two means. Unfortunately, what we don't get out of this is standard deviation or standard error and uh, effect size. So we're gonna have to calculate that ourselves. So I'm going to use tapply again, and so we're going to do uh, measure one, okay. and we're going to calculate this by group, so group, now let's calculate the mean. Okay, I know we have the means, but just to prove to you that they're correct, so 10 versus 15, which is what I set them up to be, copy that whole line, and this time do standard deviation, and now I have the standard deviations of those two. And look how equal those are. So the point of homogeneity is actually that the variances are the same. And that's pretty damn close. So uh, that's another way to check your chart. And then when we get into ANOVAs, we'll talk about Levine's test. The other function you can do is length. And length will allow you to calculate standard error. So I have another video on how to calculate standard error. Um, but if I wanted standard error, what I could do is take each one of these. So I've got the mean, the standard deviation, and n, uh, n yeah. Call this a little n because it's by group. So my standard error would be the standard deviation divided by square root of n. Okay. And now when I look at those, I have the standard the standard error for each group. So you could report either one. Whatever strikes your fancy. It just be consistent. So I have all these numbers now, and I can tell that um, they're significantly different, 10 and 15, so my two classes start in a different place. So I made my class better because um, I'm partial to them, I see them in person. But what happens in measure 2 now? So let's do this whole thing again and see if they're still different for measure 2. So y is approximated by x, so measure 2 approximately group. I got my data set, no out. We're going to do variance, we're going to hit the wrong button. There we go, variance equals true, paired equals false, and let's see what happens. So now, this must be the lower limit for P, because um, it gave us the same exact one for a very different T value. Look at this T value, it's huge. Um, now we're comparing them as a, you know 11.62 and 20. 
Remember, you'll have slightly different numbers than me if you're running the same code. Um, and so now my class has gotten a whole lot better and the YouTube group has stayed the same. So um, we could calculate all those same statistics. So I'm going to cut and paste here uh, and change everything to measure two. In reality, you'd want to change all these to, to, to so they have them all saved. The computer's grumping at me with the sheer number of things I have open, but oh well. Okay, so I could get my standard errors for group two. Okay. Um, and so it seems that our um, YouTube group isn't changing, and our class group is changing. Um, and so really we want to do this as a mixed design, but again, we're doing t-tests. So that's an independent, two different independent t-tests. Okay. Now let's say we wanted to make a chart of those. Let's just pick one, measure two, because it'll be more fancy. So I'm going to make a chart of this data set, and then I'm going to clear all this stuff out so that um, we won't have quite so much crazy going on. Um, <clears throat> so I'm going to make a chart of the independent t-test measures. And so I have to load the ggplot library. So I'm going to use ggplot2. Uh, let's make a bar chart with, um, so ggplot for bar. And the data set is no outliers. My aesthetics, AES, so I've got x, which is group, comma, y, which is measure 1. Okay. And so this is, only, this is independent t's, so we're only going to have two bars. So I'm going to take that bar chart and add some things to it. So let's add stat summary. Let's see if I can remember these off the top of my head. So function of y equals the mean. So this will give us our bars with the mean. So geom equals bar. So calculate the mean for each group and give me a bar chart. Um, fill will tell me what color it will be. This only works if you're doing uh, two bar charts. Don't do this with a mix, a multiple bar chart design. And color equals black. Okay, so fill does the uh, interior of the bar, color does the exterior. So let's add some error bars to that. So function of the data equals mean CO normal for normal distribution error bars. <clears throat> And our data is normal, so I'm going to go with that. We're going to do geom equals error bar. We're going to make them a little bit smaller, because otherwise they look crazy. So width equals 0.2. And I'm going to tell it to dodge. Okay, which sometimes does stuff and sometimes doesn't. So let's pause right there and make sure we're getting a plot we're expecting. And I haven't typed anything incorrect. There we go. So here's our really ugly plot. So let me clean this up some more. So my X lab, so my X label will be learning group. My Y label will be average confidence score, because I made this data up. And I, I like my X labels just fine. Um, they both look right. But if I wanted to change that, I could do scale X discrete and do labels equals let's see YouTube looks fine um, but we could do watched YouTube and then we could do came to class okay. so let's make that chart real quick and then we'll do a little bit more cleanup I'll show you some other stuff so now I've changed those two but the other thing I haven't talked about in my videos is Y limits. So I'm going to do one more this time, something new. So scale Y continuous, because Y is continuous. And I'm going to do limits, spelled correctly, there we go. And I'm going to do lower limit, comma, upper limit. So it ranges from 0 to 20. So this is a way to change how tall the graph is. So let's highlight all of that. And now it ranges from 0 to 20. So I can change. Um, basically the issues with uh, distorting a graph, making it too short or too tall. See, I could make it 0 to 100 to make the difference look really small. Okay, but if the upper limit is 20, I could add that in. 
And the other thing I'm going to do is add in a bunch of theme coding, um, which I have copied over here. And I will place right here for you guys. So this is just code that will help clean up the data set. Um, and I talk about this more in my graphs data. I'm just going to offload that into the word cleanup because I, if I, I might use, I'm going to use it again here in a little bit. So that'll help get rid of that ugly background line. And there we go. So that is a pretty chart that shows that there is a rather large difference between the two groups. Now, um, I have my chart. I have my means and my standard deviations. What now? Well, the what now is effect size. So I'm going to go back to these bad boys real quick and talk about mean. Let's do SD. You can do either one and N here. So I'm going to use a little program that our research lab made called Moat, which is freely available on my website. This version is a little different than the one on my website, <laughs> but it all works the same. There you go. So Moat is a free um, effect size program. There's another video on YouTube that tells you how to work Moat if you want to learn more. But for an independent t-test, you have effectively two options. So under measures here, I'm going to drop down. I'm going to go down to independent t-test. And this is the traditional independent t-test um, put forward by Cohen. And so it's got the pooled standard deviation on the bottom. And so you want to type in your means. So I got 10, um, 15.23. So I'm pulling these numbers from down here. Type in your standard deviations, 2.38. 2.07. You're going to notice that standard error automatically calculated. Those are not the numbers that I had because I need to do group size. Okay. And so the cool thing about our little program here is that it auto calculates the um, standard errors for you or in reverse standard deviation. So you need to enter mean standard something, either one, and n. And so people forget n. Okay. So be sure you enter n. It automatically gives you T, so I could check this against my t-test value, which is not that one um, here. 11.70, 11.72 is pretty close. If I used more decimals, it would be even more, even closer. And then that down here gives me my Cohen's D. So it's 2.34, which means there are two standard deviations apart, which is a large effect size. It also gives you the pretty picture version over here. Um, <clears throat> And so uh, I could use this picture to talk about, look, this group is skinnier, and the effect size difference is 2.34, but that's a different video. And so I could use that number um, to show that this is a large effect. Okay. So what do I do with this effect size? Well, let's say you want to do study number two. So I ran 100 people the first time. Did I really need 100? So let's try G power now. Okay. If you're on a Mac, the calculate button is always off the screen. Sorry. Not my program. So what we're going to do to do G power for independent T, let's click on t-test. Here under statistical test, it's two independent means, two groups. Okay, and that's important. Make sure you're doing two groups. It automatically selects a one-tailed test. You might want to change that to two, considering most people think one-tailed tests are cheating. If you have a one-tailed test, they'll leave it at one. And I actually already have D calculated. So I'm going to just type it in here. If you did not have D calculated, you could click determine and type in all the numbers and it will give us the same number we already have. So I'm going to close that. So I've already calculated D. Um, and I like this, my program a little better because I'm partial, but also because it will give me T and make sure I'm doing it correctly. Um, so power, we're going to list as 0.8 as industry standard. My allocation ratio is one to one, so I have 50 people in each group. Well, how many people did I need? Probably way less. It says I need 10 people. So with an effect size that large, I only needed 10 people. So I have way more people than I needed. And so that would allow you to estimate the number of people. Honestly, you want to do, um, thank you, go away. Sorry, not now. Joink. Okay. So you want to do this analysis at the beginning with an estimated effect size. But since we have a real number now, I'm just going to show you so that you can see um, how you could take these effect sizes that you have and use them in G-Power. Alright, um, the other, sorry, 
got distracted. The other option that you can have that you can use in Moat is uh, hedges. So hedges G, which is a correction on Cohen's D, it has the exact same screen. And so this just allows you to add in the correction. So you see here it says hedges correction. That's the only difference between the two screens. So there's no correction on this screen. Um, and so I would type in the numbers in the exact same way. So 10, 15.2, 15 uh, 2.38, 2.07, 50 and 50, and then now it's 2.32. So it fixed the effect size for us using that correction value. All right, and Mova, Moat is a Java-based program, so it will run on any computer that has Java. All right, now let's do dependent T. Now with dependent T, and I said I was going to broom this, so let me clear this out just so there's less going on in my computer. And I'm going to remake up my data here. Uh, I'm going to still use no out, so I'm just going to kind of cheat real quick. You don't have to clear yours out, but my computer's struggle busting right now. There we go. Okay, so I have my um, no out data set, and let's work with... Um, the dependency this time. <clears throat> All right, so with dependency, one problem that you have is that the data set is in wide format. So the first thing we're gonna do is switch this to long format. Okay. And so really, if you only had dependency, you would not have this group column. But let's load the reshape library, which will allow us to change this from wide to long. So I'm gonna call this long no out. So the function is melt. Data site goes first, no out. Um, your ID variables, so I have one called group, okay, or participant number is another way to do this. Um, measured variables, and I have two of them. So I've got measure one and measure two. And that will create us a wide or long data set, hence the name. So it just basically takes those two columns and puts them underneath each other. So now that I have the data in the right format, I might consider relabeling the automatic labels that you get, which is variable and value, which is not super helpful. So let's do that. Uh, call names of long data, long, sorry, no out equals, so we still got group, and then this is our time for measurement, and this is their confidence. And that gives the labels a little better. So I wanna see if there's a difference in confidence levels based on when I measured them. So I either measured them at the beginning or the end. Are there confidence levels going up, going down, what are they doing? So I'm ignoring group right now, and I'm just looking to see if confidence is going up or down. And so let's do that t-test, t.test. So it's still y is x, so y is confidence in this example. x is what time we measured them at. We are going to use the long no outlier data set. Now the var dot equal here does not actually do anything because there's no correction, but it doesn't hurt you to include. It just ignores it. Um, and so you can't forget to do it on independent t if you always do it. Because uh, the uh, default for var dot equals actually false. Now paired this time is also true. Okay, so you know you're going to get a paired t-test. And the output's a little different, so you can make sure you're doing it right. Okay. So here's our paired t-test. Um, and so we've got that the <clears throat> t-value is 13. At 99 degrees of freedom, so it's n minus 1. And then that's the only one variable we're calculating. And so independent t is n minus 2 because you have to calculate group mean 1 and group mean 2. But dependent t is n minus 1 because you're only calculating the, the mean difference score. And that's what this is. And so the confidence interval is on the mean difference score. So people are going up on average 3 points from time 1 to time 2. 
which isn't a whole lot, but maybe three points is a lot. So is that significantly different? Yes, it is, because P is less than 0.05. Okay. And I swear P does change. I made this too, too good. The P values are just sort of, I guess that's the lower limit that R can calculate. Okay. Um, and so I do, I do find it odd that we have them the same every single time, but it's not on purpose, I promise. Now let's calculate the mean standard deviations so we can calculate effect size. Um, so we got T apply, it's gonna be columns. So long, no out for confidence. Um, group, which is time in this example. Okay, and the mean. So there's the overall measure of the differences in means. That's standard deviation for each group in or each time piece separately. That is not the standard deviation of the differences. It's the standard deviation of each separate time measurement. And length is a little superfluous here, but just in case you weren't sure, there's a hundred measurements at each time. So there's only a hundred people in this study, but we've measured each person twice. So there are 200 data points but only 100 people. And that's something you just have to know because in long format, it does look like 200 people. Um, and so that's why I say it always helps. Maybe it helps to start in wide format. So you know you only have 100 people, but we have 100 people measured twice. Let's try effect size. So there are two different effect sizes that we can use. So I'm gonna click on measures here. There's dependent T averages. So I'm gonna start with that one. So the dependent T um, effect size calculation traditionally has the standard deviation of the different scores on the bottom, so the denominator. But there's a recent push to really move to the stand to have an average standard deviation of each time point on the bottom, in the sense that that does not overestimate the effect size. And so people argue that this is a more realistic effect size because it has an average standard deviation on the bottom rather than an inflated difference because it's a standard deviation of the different scores. Um, and so the way you calculate this is actually very similar to independent T. And so what we do is we type in each mean. So I've got 12, 22, uh, 15, 97. It will auto calculate that mean difference for us. And then I would calculate the, add in the standard deviations, 3.36, 4.3, 4. It auto calculates the standard error, but I need to fill in size. So it's only 100 people. Okay, so there's 100. Now T will not match. So do not expect T to match here because they're calculated in very different ways at this point. But it says that the effect size is large. It's 0.97. Okay, so that difference is a large effect of 0.97. Um, the other option, go to measures. Go standard deviation differences. This is the more traditional calculation. And I could enter all this stuff, but I actually don't have an easy way to get the different scores. It doesn't involve a whole lot of subtracting in math. Um, and so I'd, I tell you not to do that. Um, and if you want to calculate those numbers, what you would do is take your two columns in wide format and subtract them from each other. And then calculate the mean as standard deviation on that. And I'll show you how to do that in just a second. But let's just say I could type in the size and the t-statistic. So the t-statistic is 13.22. I got that from right here. And that Cohen's d is 1.32. So these tend to be very different because they have a different denominator, so different numbers in the bottom. Okay. This SD difference one is more traditional. Uh, SD av or the average standard deviations is sort of up and coming. I tend to like SD differences because it has, uh, if you think about test statistics, this is very math based, so you can tune me out if you're not a math person. But when you're talking about independent T translated into from D to T and single sample T from D to T, you're moving just from standard deviation to standard error on the bottom, and so they're tied to the distribution. If you're going to do dependent T averages, you're actually completely changing the, the denominator, and so it no longer matches the test statistic. And so I think ddiff at least matches the test statistic, uh, which is what you're trying to calculate, which you should base your power calculations based on, on the test statistic and not um, independent t's statistic. So it basically underestimates power. However, 
I do think that a lot of the studies have shown that uh, the average may give you a better estimate of the population effect size. So they each have their, their pros and cons. Um, I think either one is appropriate as long as you tell which people which one you're doing. So don't just call it Co and Steve. Tell them it's the differences or the averages. It's my push for appropriate reporting. So let me, let's say, let's say you did want to get the mean difference score and standard deviation slash standard error of the differences. And I'm going to do this on the original data set. So what you want to do is create yourself a differences column and then just subtract the two different scores. So I'm going to say no out measure one minus no out measure two. You can do that in either order. Okay, so now I have a differences column. This is how much people change between the two time points. And I can just straight take a mean on that. So the average difference is 3.75, which should look very familiar. Standard deviation of the differences is 2.83. So now I have those two numbers. And if I divided those two out, I would get my 1.32 that I have over here. And it's positive because I left off the negative in the T statistic. Okay, so I could get the numbers to calculate here and fill it in using those numbers. It's not terribly hard. Um, but I just find Moat a little bit more user friendly because it tells you what numbers you're using. Okay. If you want to know about the more inner workings of Moat, we also have a user's guide that tells you what number to enter where. So let me close Moat here. <clears throat> All right, now, uh, while I'm doing this, G power, and then I'll go back to charts. Sorry, I got distracted. <clears throat> and so if I want to calculate the number of people I need, still a t-test here, and now I have means, differences between two dependent means matched pairs, so that's repeated measures. I still want two tails. So my effect size, let's do the first one, was 9.93. Off was 0.05, power was 0.8. It's industry standard. I need 12 people, so I have way too many. If I had an effect size of 1.32, I would only need seven. And so that is really where it gets to be tricky, is because the two different effect sizes have different um, estimates so, uh, of the number of people you need. And so if you have both, I would tell you to go with a larger number, because then you can't go wrong, so you won't miss something. So that's G power. Now let's make a graph. So I'm going to graph this data. Um, so let's see here. We're going to use the long data set because you have to have a long data set. So my second bar chart here is going to be ggplot. And we've got the long no outlier data, which I misspelled. There we go. <clears throat> my aesthetic is I have x, which is time, and y, which is confidence. So let's start adding stuff on. And to save you all the struggle of me typing this all out, all of this is going to stay the same. So I'm going to highlight this. That stat summary does not change because we're still working in long format. Beach ball of death. There we go. So let's see what this looks like. So, not so bad. That's what we wanted. Now let's clean that up. So, the Y lab is uh, confidence ratings. The X lab is time of rating. My scale of X, discrete, I'm going to change these levels because they're hideous. There we go. So time one versus time two. Okay. And then I'm also change my Y limit just to show you one more time. So uh, scale Y and it's continuous limit sa equals zero to 20. Last but not least, my cleanup function. Well, it's not a function, sorry. My cleanup code. 
Oh no, I broomed it. So I had gotten rid of it. Let me rerun that. Forgot about that. Nope. All right, so now we have a much better graph that shows that um, there's a difference between the two ratings. It's only three points. And so it doesn't look significant, but this is repeated measures, and so it is significant because it accounts for the fact that these are the same people twice. Um, so you can't quite just look at the error bars, but the error bars don't totally look like they overlap, so they would be considered um, different if you were to use confidence interval testing instead. And so all of that is how to do t-tests in R, both types, with data screening, effect size, and power. Um, and so the only other thing you'd really have to learn is how to do APA style reporting, um, which I would tell you to watch some of my other videos for because that doesn't change SPSS or R, um, or you can use Purdue's OWL website. It's really great as well. So that is the end of the t-test video. Woohoo!